I can guarantee you that there isn't one person who's tracking on a physical list who is number 999 who has requested a black Birkin in size 30. Hello my friends, my name is GPS and welcome back. It's been way over a year since the last installment to one of the original series that I started on my YouTube, which was busting by Hermes Smith in one go. I used to love making these videos because I personally found it really challenging when I was first getting into Hermes to find accurate and reliable information out there because there is so much misinformation and misconception floating around out there, of course mixed in with some really valuable intel. So I love fact checking all these things that are really often said about Hermes and today we have some really exciting topics to touch on. We'll discuss the infamous Hermes waitlist. Is there really one? And if there is, how can you get in line? What purchases will help you qualify for a bag? And then we'll have to touch on the topic of exotic skins. Are all exotic skins made the same? Are there ones that are less expensive than others? So if these sound interesting to you and you'd like to hear my thoughts and my experience, then please be sure to give this video a thumbs up and keep on watching. As always, when it comes to filming these types of videos, I like to make the disclaimer that I do not work for Hermes and I never have. All I'm sharing is my thoughts, my experiences, and everything that I picked up along the way because I have been very fortunate to shop with some extremely insightful and knowledgeable people on the brand. But your first resource and the best resource that you have is of course the person you shop with at RMS. So make sure that you listen to them. But these are just my experiences and what I have learned over the years. And obviously I have a running list of all the topics that I would like to discuss, some of the things that I hear and see out there. But I actually asked you yesterday over on my Instagram, if there is anything that you've always been curious about, are there any myth that you would like me to discuss? And I have received a bunch of them, a lot of which actually aligned with the topics that I wanted to sort of chat about today, but I did add in a couple of them from your list. And if you enjoy this video, then make sure to let me know by giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing down below. And I'll make sure to do more of them in case you'd want me to. So the first myth that I would like to clear up today is the idea of a traditional wait list that you are put on a list whenever you put in a request for a bag, you get assigned a number, and you will just get a call one day whenever it's your turn to pick up the bag that you requested. Well, in my experience and my personal opinion, shopping in the US for many years and shopping in quite a few different countries within Europe, a traditional waiting list does not exist. It's not nearly as simple as that. It's not like you just walk into a store, you put in a request these days and they let you know whenever it's your turn. Obviously, it is possible that you express your interest for a bag and you don't even have to go back to the store that regularly and pick up anything else to get your hands on a bag. It doesn't happen often, but it does. But that is still not a wait list. I can guarantee you that there isn't one person who's tracking on a physical list who is number 999 who has requested a black Birkin in size 30 and they're waiting for that person's turn to come around. There isn't a wait list as such. What exists, however, is a wish list, which is completely different from a wait list where you're waiting in line for a bag to come in. A wish list is basically you expressing your interest for a certain type, color, size, and shape of a bag, which is something that can be as informal as a conversation, as an email, as a text message, depending on where you shop and who you shop with or it can be quite as formal as filling out an actual physical form with the exact specs of the bags that you would like to add to your collection. I have done both depending on where I shopped and what I asked for. 
And in both cases, they worked, but a wish list is very different from an actual wait list. Wish lists you can fill out or put in usually at the beginning of the year or when RMS still had their traditional quota system where you requested a bag in the first half of the year and then another one in the second half. You used to put it in either at the beginning of the year or when the second half of the year began. So these days you can put them in anytime, obviously depends on where you shop, who you shop with, when you even started shopping. But you really don't have to worry about tracking your place in line and worrying about the fact that there might be a thousand people ahead of you waiting for the exact same bag because there probably are a thousand other people who would be just as happy to add a bag to their collection as you are. But in most countries and in most stores, it comes down to the rapport and the relationship that you have with the brand over when you put in a request and where you're actually standing in a line that, let's be honest, doesn't exist. Moving on, some people will tell you that there are certain categories that don't actually show up on your profile and don't help to qualify you for getting your hands on your dream bag, be it a Kelly, a Birkin, or Constance, which are sort of the holy trinity of RMS bags that are quite difficult to add to your collection. Although, let's be honest, with RMS, everything can be challenging because they produce so few of everything in their lineup. But is it true that there are certain pieces that you can buy from RMS that will not help you along the way? Well, in my experience, it is not the case. Whatever you buy, from Hermes will show up on your profile, not only on the list of things that the managers and the people you shop with have access to when they are approving your request for a bag to be released to you, but they also add up to the amount, which is the total amount that you have spent with the brand, which is not a number that I think you should really worry about. As I always say, focus on quality over quantity. Focus on the pieces that you buy and the diversity of the pieces that you pick up over how much you actually purchase because there is no point outspending yourself just so you can get your hands on a bag one day when you really don't need to. I think it's a much better idea for you to experiment with the brand and try different pieces from different metiers rather than focusing on buying 10 of everything that they put in front of you. And in my experience, there isn't any category that does not count towards you getting your hands on a bag. But if you only want to buy Lindy's Picatins and then you want a Constance, and then you buy another Picatin, another Lindy, and then you want a Birkin, that can be a little bit tough. I would highly suggest that you explore more of what the brand has to offer. But in my experience and in my opinion, Every single piece that you buy will not only count towards your purchase history, but it will also help you with getting to know the brand, getting to know the person that you shop with, and you're also giving them the chance to get to know you and see what pieces you're truly after. So I honestly would not worry about what counts and what doesn't. Don't outspend yourself. Don't worry about what you're spending on and how much you're spending. Think about what pieces you will truly enjoy and which are the ones that you'll be able to take advantage of in your collection. Myth number three is that every single Hermes bag other than Birkins and Kelly's are overpriced and not worth the investment, which this statement is quite complex and it really comes down to how you look at, first of all, the idea of an investment when it comes to luxury purchases and what you're looking to get out of your Hermes bags. Because the statement that bags are not a good investment, other Birkins and Kellys. When it comes to a financial investment, yes, they are not. But I would argue that even Birkins and Kellys are not the best investment these days. Because if you have a bag in your collection that you have used and abused and enjoyed, I think you will find that you will have a tougher time selling it these days than you would have years ago, purely because of the massive amount of resellers, and consignment sites out there, not to mention the amount of offering that resellers have to offer these days, especially if you're selling a bag that is not on trend. And trust me, I'm talking from experience 
because I sold quite a few of my larger Birkins that I started my collection with, which were Birkin 40s many, many years ago during the heyday of mini and micro bags. And at that time, I actually lost quite a bit of money by selling those larger bags that were not that much in demand. So you will not make money off of your bags unless you choose wisely. You don't really use your bags or you take good care of them and you sell them when they are on trend. Now, obviously there are exceptions to the rules, some of them being the more classic sizes. So for example, a Kelly 28 will never really go in and out of style because it's such a classic style, size and shape. So that is not one that you have to particularly worry about. Or if you purchase a bag that is limited edition, for example, the new marble printed Constance, the 123 and away we go Birkin, something like the Kelly doll or Himalaya. These are so-called exceptional pieces, meaning that Hermes produces much fewer of them, even fewer than how many Birkins and Kellys they put out. So these tend to go at a much higher price on the resale market. So again, these bags are truly a good financial investment even if you're going to use them and enjoy them for a little while and you're going to be gentle on them. But people do tend to point out that there are certain bags not nearly as desirable as a Birkin or a Kelly that are priced at the same price point, if not even higher than those more elusive bags. But that is because it doesn't matter what leather good or what bag Hermes launches, you can be assured that they have put the same quality, craftsmanship, resources, creativity, and raw materials behind everything that they launch. All of their bags are made in France by the same craftsmen who at one point will be making Birkins and Kellys. So it would be kind of weird if they price their pieces based on the hype, not based on the quality, the time spent on each piece, and the raw materials and resources used to put these bags together. So I actually appreciate the fact that they have a really consistent pricing system that they use. Now, whether that pricing is worth it for you or not, that is completely up to you. I believe we're going to be moving on to myth number four, which is that anything and everything is possible when you're placing a special order for an Hermes bag, which is a topic that we have discussed before. Every time I put out a request to send me questions or I mention that there is going to be a Q&A coming up or a Boston Hermes Myth video, so many of you want to talk about the special order experience, which I completely understand because it is a really thrilling but kind of secretive experience. But I have touched on this topic many times before, so I make sure to have some resources link up here for you and also down below of some previous videos where I go more into details about the special order or so-called a la carte experience. But the aspect of it that I wanted to discuss today is this idea that everything is possible once you've been invited to place a special order for a bag, which is far from the truth. That is not the case. Even though it is an exciting experience where you can be quite creative, it's not like whatever you want can be made. There are going to be restrictions that you will face once you're there at your appointment placing your order. So there are going to be a few different lists that you have to stick to. First of all, you have to choose the bag that you'd like to place an order for. And even though that list is quite long, it doesn't include every single bag that Hermes has ever come out with. Obviously, most people tend to go for Birkins, Kellys, and maybe even sometimes Constances, because those are the bags that are hard to come by. But if you really wanted to, you could absolutely place a special order for a Lindy, for an HAC, even for a Bolid. But you couldn't place a special order for a bag that doesn't exist or has been discontinued. So that is something for you to keep in mind. The next list you will want to have a really close look at is the list of colors and leathers available, which not only changes every single season, but it can vary depending on stores even, because certain stores will have a list much shorter than others depending on 
if Hermes allows them to place an order for exotic bags, if they don't, what kind of exotic skins they have available and which ones they do not. And on that list, you will be told what leathers will be available, what colors will come in each individual leather. Because it's not like if you want a rose sakura bag, you can just walk in and request a rose sakura bag if that color is not listed on the list. And then you also have to cross-reference to make sure that the leather you chose is available in the bag that you wanted it because sometimes that's unfortunately not an option. So you will have to be really careful with sticking to your list because I think in theory, you could put in a request for whatever bag you want. But if you're not choosing from the list of bags and from the list of colors and leathers, your choice will be rejected. And then for hardware, you will have the three options of gold, palladium, or perma brass. But if you decide to opt for either gold or palladium, you'll also be able to choose between a brushed or a polished finish. But these are really all the three options you have available. You cannot choose tone on tone or going for a solid precious metals. Those are pieces that you'll either have to get offered or you have to participate in the so-called Horizon Project by Hermes, which is something that we discussed in a really recent video of mine. And then our last myth for today is that the most expensive bags created by Hermes are made of exotic skin and to be specific, crocodile skin. Well, this statement is only true when it comes to actual leather bags, because leather bags are not technically the most expensive bags created by Hermes. Hermes has done many different functional bags in the past made of precious metals that are made of solid gold and that are encrusted with diamonds in the shape of Birkins, Kellys, and even clutch bags inspired by their iconic Shandong pattern. So when it comes to bags in general, that statement doesn't stand true. But when it comes to actual leather bags, croc bags today are the most expensive bags that you can buy from Hermes. Pre-loved, I'm not quite sure because there are so many discontinued exotic bags that Hermes used in the past then I'm sure you could find one that is more rare than Croc that would be priced just a little bit higher. Just to give you a couple of examples, Hermes used skins like elephant skin, string ray, even whale in the past that you might find priced higher than just a regular alligator or Croc bag at an auction house or at a reseller purely because there still might be demand but supply is virtually non-existent. Hermes used to have a much broader portfolio of skins that they were able to use, but these days because of restrictions, they can only choose from a few of those. But even today, not all exotic bags are made of the exact same skin. And because of that, they are not priced equally either. So today you have three main categories of exotic skins when it comes to scales such as crocs and alligator, and a couple when it comes to lizard. When we talk about the most expensive exotic bags made by Hermes, other than the Himalaya, we often talk about the so-called porosus croc, which you can easily recognize by tiny little dots on each scale, which are actually the pores of the croc, which is where the name comes from, porosus croc. And this seawater croc is the most expensive for a couple of reasons, mainly because it's the softest out of the bunch, so it has the most supple, luxurious feel to it. And then seawater croc is also known for having the most consistent gradients to it. So if you look at a larger piece that is made of seawater croc, which is usually what seawater croc is used for, they usually won't waste this type of skin on something small, they usually want it to be featured on a larger bag that can really showcase its true beauty, which is the consistent gradients that you can see from the scales going from quite small to larger as you go closer to the center of the bag. Then we have Nilo Croc, which is freshwater croc. This one is a little bit more difficult to recognize just because there are certain Nilo Crocs that do have visible pores and there are ones that actually don't. 
But Nilo Croc is a preferred choice for bags like the Himalaya, mainly because the scales are much larger and more symmetric if you look at the bag as a whole. Obviously, these will also have some gradients to them, but nowhere near as even as Porosus Croc, but the scales are going to be larger and more symmetric. And then the last option, which is very often confused with croc, is actually alligator or Mississippi alligator. This is a skin that is often used not only for small leather goods, but also for smaller bags. Now this skin happens to be my personal favorite when it comes to exotic skins, because it tends to be just a tiny bit tougher than croc skins. Not by a lot, but if I had to rank each exotic skin when it comes to croc and alligator skins, alligator would definitely have to be on top, mainly in lisse or shiny finish, just because it's less prone to marks and scratches. But then if you choose lisse, you have to worry about moisture and any sort of liquids around your bags. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what finish you go for, lisse or matte, you will want to baby these bags because they are fragile and delicate, but alligator is known for being just a tiny bit more resilient. And then the way you would recognize alligator is by looking at the scales. The scales of an alligator bag tend to be a little bit more pronounced and they almost look like little islands floating because you can definitely run your fingers very clearly around the edges of each individual scale, which is a great way of telling the difference between a croc and an alligator skin. Alligator is going to be just a little bit rougher and the scales are going to be more pronounced. And it tends to be the least mind-blowingly expensive, let me just put it that way. And this is how we have just busted five RMS myth. I hope you enjoyed this and if you did, let me know by giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing down below in case you have not. And if there are any other Hermes myths that you'd like me to discuss in upcoming videos or if you have any thoughts on the ones that we talked about today, let's have a discussion in the comment section down below. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you being here and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.